Good morning, church family. I want to thank you all for praying for the team that was in Haiti. Uh, we got back late uh, Friday night, and a number of us have been recovering from a very uh, full season of ministry. Uh, Pastor Mitch and Pastor uh, Matt and Pastor Ronnie Perry from uh, New Song Church in West Palm, uh, as well as a number of uh, members from our congregation had a chance to go down and minister the gospel in word and in deed to some very, very needy people whom the world has forgot, but the master hasn't forgotten them, amen? So we are grateful for all of those of you who were praying for us while we were away, covering us with prayer uh, in the midst of some pretty thick spiritual warfare, which will be our topic for today. But I also wanted to remind uh, each of us this morning that Father has a blessing in store for you. I've sensed even in my time with him today a great upwelling of compassion. Some of you need to be set free from, being, from continuing to walk in the kingdom of darkness. Others of you today who are in Christ need to re realize a greater measure of freedom that Jesus has secured for you in the gospel. Many of us have come here with burdens, uh, with needs, things that need to be healed in our inner man, and Father desires to do that today. Can I hear an amen in the house? So today, as we get ready to begin, uh, I'm going to be looking into a selection, uh, several selections, one from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and another one, uh, a selection from Ephesians chapter six, to the church that he planted and that he loved, that he stayed at for a number of years, and that he felt as if he were a spiritual father to. For many of you, in some ways, I feel like I'm a spiritual father to you, and I want to help you to understand that there is a battle that is raging all around us. In a world that is filled with warfare, there's a deeper, more profound, more impacting war that's going on that many of us don't have any idea about. We remain oblivious to it, we're ignorant to it, and because of that, the evil one has greater access to our joy and our destiny than he would otherwise. That's gonna stop today in Jesus' name. So if you have your Bibles, I wanna begin today with the gospel. All good preaching as a, a professor of mine said many years ago, begins with the gospel, it rehearses the gospel, and, invite, and it invites people to respond to the gospel. There will be a time for you to respond at the end of the service today, whether you need to get right with Jesus and accept him as your savior, or you need healing, or you need deliverance from some affliction in your life, come forward and receive prayer. We'll have our prayer team here. They would love to pray for you. Prayer is powerful. It changes things in heaven and on earth. Does anyone believe that here today? In Colossians chapter one and verse 11, Paul says this to the church at Colossae. And I don't have a slide for this because this is impromptu prophetic download. So you're gonna receive this free of charge this morning. Is that okay with you? Okay, let's go. In verse 11 it says this. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you, I love that, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And here's the gospel in one sentence. For those of you who know him, and for those of you who need to have a relationship with Jesus, not just know about him, but to experience his living reality, transforming you, every aspect of your person, from the inside out. Listen to what Paul reminds the church of about God's desire to deliver. He says this, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, he literally has snatched us from bondage and transferred us, picked us up and moved us like a father would take a child from a difficult and dangerous situation to a situation with blessing and freedom and goodness. Say amen if that's you today. Has God done that for you today? 
He's transferred us from darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. If this gospel thing is new to you, if you're coming in from off the street or from a house somewhere or you're, uh, you, maybe your grandmother or your father invited you to come to church today, the gospel is very simple. It teaches us that he who created the universe and who watched his, his creation rebel against him took the form of a man, descended and moved into our neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson says in his translation of the message, and lived a sinless life where he showed us the way to the Father. He showed us by his own declaration, proclamation, and demonstration what it looks like to live in a way that is pleasing to Papa. And then he stretched forth his arms on a cross and gave up his life to atone for your filth and for mine, for your degradation and mine, so that we who don't deserve anything from God, we who were in a rebellion against God, who were ignorant of the truth and desirous of the darkness, might have eternal life. On the third day he was resurrected. He appeared to over 500 people, the scripture says, and ascended into heaven after charging his disciples to carry on the mission and ministry of reconciliation that he inaugurated, not just in what he said, but literally what he did as he bled on the cross for you and you or I. You cannot earn your way into God's favor. You can't please him. All you can do is present your filth to him that you might receive Jesus' righteousness in return. Amen? And in doing that and throwing yourself down on the mercy of Jesus and asking him to be the Lord of your life, the king of your life, your master, your rabbi, his spirit invades your inner man, fills you up in a great spiritual wind that none can see. But if you've experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. And nothing is ever the same again. Part of experiencing the blessing of the kingdom of God, not just in the future, but right here, right now, is the power and the provision and the protection and the very presence of God in the moment by moment in which we live. Are you experiencing that today? In some ways, all of us long for and require more of those things. And we are bound up in the midst of hand-to-hand combat. We've been taken prisoner, some of us, by an enemy who's already been defeated. And Jesus longs to break those chains for those of you who are struggling with addiction, whether that's drugs or alcohol or religious pride, anger, hypocrisy, judgmentalism, whatever your sin du jour is, that soft white underbelly where the where the devil loves to afflict you because he knows you're gonna fall for it every time. You need victory in Jesus' name, amen? So in Colossians chapter one, Paul sets the stage. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians in just a moment. But I want you to understand that the nature of life is war. Jesus told us it was going to be that way. There would be wars and rumors of wars until the the great war is finally concluded and the devil and all of his minions, every work of darkness, discouragement, despair, death is finally cast aside, never to be remembered anymore. And I long for that day. Do you? But in the meantime, it's time to declare war as one of my favorite gospel singers, Kurt Carr, says. It's time for the church to get out of the foxhole and declare war. It's time for the church to stop hiding in the bottom in the mud and in the blood and get up off and over the top in the power of the blood and take some ground for the kingdom of God as King Jesus goes out before. Does anybody believe that here today? The only way you're going to do that is to know the nature of your enemy and how to defeat him. What weapons that you've been given by God's spirit, by God the Father himself according to his degree, and by the purchase of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Does anybody know what October 7th, 2001, what happened on that date? That is when our country went to war, and we have been at war in Southwest Asia ever since. 
6,200 days of war and counting. A whole generation has grown up in the midst of a war that many of us don't care about, don't have any connect point with, unless we know someone in our family who's serving there. This is, time, this is a time of war for the United States, but it's also a time of war for the church. Now, we don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be timid. We don't need to be discouraged, and I think right now, because the evil one's gonna try to stir some of that up, I think I need to pray and break that in the name of Jesus. Let's go, let's, pray. let's go before the Father right now. Lord, thank you that you have accomplished the victory at Calvary when you gave up your life and poured out your blood and secured for us a position in heaven and power to live in a congruence with your teaching here on earth. Lord, we know that we have an adversary who seeks, who prowls about like a roaring lion, looking to whom he may kill and devour. We know how he works, God. You told us in John's gospel that his whole plan is to steal and to kill and destroy. So today we ask you in the power of your spirit to give us illumination and revelation that you would bind every fear that we might have, particularly, God, if we're still walking in darkness, and you would cause the light of your son to irradiate every part, every piece of our heart and our soul and our spirit this morning. We receive your fullness in the name of Jesus. Satan, you have no power here. Flee right now, because the word of God's about to come forth in Jesus' name, amen. Many of us this morning are familiar with the promises of God, the good stuff. We believe in the good stuff. We've received the good stuff. We know Jeremiah chapter 29, 9, that says, you know that one? Walk through it with me, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you hope in a future, and we cling to that. And we rightly should, because God is infinitely more powerful than all of those evil forces and dominions that are arrayed against him. Somebody needs to say amen right now. Creator, creature. Creator, creature. Luther called Satan the father's junkyard dog staked down on a chain, and that's exactly what he is. He can snap and he can snarl, he can take the unwary by surprise, but if you've had your eyes open and you walk in the empowerment the Holy Spirit has given you, as we go deep in the teaching of the Word of God, you're going to receive some victory today, some victory over besetting sins, some victory in receiving your new identity. You're not a sinner any longer, you're a saint. You've been made pure by the blood of Jesus. You wear his robes. You're a saint that still struggles with sin, and we need greater victory. We need to walk in our identity. We need to understand that we are the beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God. Let's give God a hand praise this morning for that. You are the stewards of the gospel. He's given it to you in these cracked and unbelievably broken tre- uh, vessels of clay, and it's, there's a reason why it's cracked, so the light of the gospel can come out, amen? We're teaching the Haitian pastors about the nature of being transparent, how when people think that their clergy persons are without sin, they can't connect to them, and they can't connect with the gospel, and we end up doing the very thing that we hate, and that's distancing people from the one who loved them. So today, if you're broken and you're needy and you're in Christ, that's okay, because God's got some healing he wants to bring and he wants to use your brokenness and your struggle and your sin and how he's helping you to overcome it to bring those who are far from him, whom God loves, closer in that they might have a seat at the Father's table and eat with us at that party that's gonna transcend every party that the avenue will ever have, as good as these are, amen? So let's look into this together. I've already mentioned that we have an enemy. And the enemy wants you to remain oblivious. That's his first and greatest tool. He wants to allow you to coast through your life and enjoy your creature comforts and then just give Jesus some token devotion. If that's where you're at, he's got a stronghold in your life already. But when you press in 
and received a greater measure of God's goodness and his transformational power by his spirit as you go deep in his word, you will see adversity rise up against you. That's when the evil one will reveal himself. I have mentioned the fact that we must be sober-minded. If you have your Bibles, again, this isn't on the overhead. This is part of the intro here. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, if you've got your Bible, open up to it. If you've got something to take notes, take notes, because some of these things that I'm going to say might be worth uh, capturing. We're reminded that we must be sober and vigilant because we have an adversary. So our lack of awareness and preparation is going to cease in Jesus' name. Let's look at what today's sermon is going to uncover for us from the scriptures as we continue to lean into our destiny as people of the word and people of the spirit. Amen? They attest to one another, they strengthen one another, they illumine one another, and we're gonna see what God has for us today. The first thing, this first point that you need to capture is this. Our world exists in a perpetual state of war. We've established that fact already. Secondly, our weapons are spiritually superior to our enemy's arsenal. Listen, how do you win a war? Take it from one who knows. You go in with overwhelming force with superior firepower. That's how the Marines kick butts all around the world. Superior training probably helps too. You have superior force and superior firepower as you avail yourself to the scriptures and to the spirit of God. Somebody say amen. Thirdly, our weapons are empowered, empowered, given strength given efficacy to destroy every stronghold that resists the gospel. Now it's at this point, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three and four. I think that's gonna be on the screen behind me. Follow along in your own scripture if you have it. You need to become proficient in the word of God, not dependent on technology. That's a, a pastoral word for you today, okay? Maybe it's a bit prophetic for some of us too. You need to know where to find this stuff in Jesus' love letter for you, y'all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three and four, it says this, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have, read this with me, church, divine power to destroy strongholds. Everything that I just suggested to you is gonna flow out of an exegesis of what the Apostle Paul teaches the church at Corinth in this one jam-packed prescription for victory. Are you ready? Put your seatbelt on, here we go. You will always be in a battle. Always, your entire life. Some of you here today are hoping that when you get on the other side of this battle that you're in the midst of, it's gonna be all roses and I don't, I don't even know what we, we would call it. No struggle at all. Listen, the, the young people say, the struggle is real. <laughs> Listen, friends, let an old man say this morning, the struggle is real. And you will never come to a place where every wrinkle in your experience is ironed out. Not until you see Jesus face to face. Father will take you to the top of mountains where you will will have unbelievable victories, but he will take you by the hand and guide you back down into the valley. Boy, that's inconvenient and inconsiderate of him, isn't it? All of the life that he's given us here is beautiful and it should be savored every moment of it, no matter how difficult it may be for you right now. But the difference between, listen, everybody has trouble. Jesus said that in the Gospels. Life is filled with it. Here's the difference, friend, particularly if you haven't trusted in Christ for your Savior this morning. You're gonna have trouble, but who's gonna walk through it with you? King Jesus is walking by my side, and he's got my hand, and if you've trusted in him, he's got yours too. And sometimes, he drags us along, like a father would do. Did you ever do that? Maybe I was the only father that did that, when my son or my daughter decided they'd had enough, and laid down, I just kind of dragged them a little bit behind me. Being transparent here today, true confession brings healing. Jesus doesn't drag us in that manner. He literally will pick us up and carry us in his arms. 
He will care for us in the midst of the battle and the struggle. And he will give you power to withstand. He will give you strength in the journey. And this is why you need other Christian people to be around you. Christianity is not a lone ranger endeavor. If you go out on your own and think you can do it by yourself, no matter how strong you are, you will be eaten alive. There are tens of thousands of people. Casey and I were just talking about that. Why is our church here? It's here to preach the gospel to those who are far from Jesus. It's here to preach the gospel for those of us who know Jesus and who gather regularly. It's also here to preach the gospel and demonstrate to the gospel to those who know Jesus but who've been so hurt and broken by the church and people in it that they can't bring themselves in through the door. We need to rescue the wounded. Because this is the place where the Spirit of God does something catalytic that you will never experience by yourself. We need one another. Whenever we're on the battlefield, we never go out by ourselves. By our, out by ourselves. We will always have a battle buddy go with, with us. Who is your battle buddy today? What is this combat that we struggle with? Well, it's about, it's a, against three things, you ready? You need to capture these. The worldly system, our own flesh, and the devil. So there's a world out there, a system, and even though we're called to go out as missionaries into the world, we must resist its pressure to conform us, not to the image of Jesus, but to the way that people who don't know him live. So there's a constant combat that's happening there. And we're not going to attack people physically, right? That's what the verse says. This is not lobbing hand grenades into the midst of a crowd of pagans, friends. Though I know some Christians who love to do that. And I wish they'd shut their mouths and sit at the feet of the master and learn more of the way of love. It's by praying for them and ministering to them and declaring the gospel over their lives and watching what God's spirit does. Our own flesh is the second thing that we're battling against in this combat. You and I have a remarkable, remarkable ability to dress our own carnal desires up in church clothes. Oh yes, I just went to Medlin, here we go. We dress up what we want in church clothes and call them God's will for our lives. Don't be deceived, God will not be mocked. God's voice sounds like God's voice, your crazy voice sounds like your crazy voice, and they don't sound anywhere near like the other. Somebody say amen. amen. The battle is to listen to God's voice and not dress ours up in his clothes. And then finally, the adversary. Listen, you have an adversary who's seeking to destroy you. And not just him, but all of the forces of evil that are arrayed behind him in legions untold. And this is not to make you fearful because just as we have Jesus and the angels, so too we have an adversary and those who serve him. But again, let's, let's make sure that we're looking at the balance here. Jesus and the angels who serve him and the devil and those who serve him. You need to be aware, but you need not be fearful. Somebody needs to write that down right now. You need to be aware, but you need not be fearful. You need to walk in the weapons that God's given you, trusting in the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God, and the presence of God in your life, amen? amen. Let's move into this further. Uh, a number of years ago, the uh, United States Air Force was, tra was testing a bomb. They called it a bunker buster. And I remember seeing this on the, on the news and hearing, from it, hearing about it from some colleagues who were still in the service. They called it the Moab. Does anybody remember that? They somewhat tongue in cheek called it the mother of all bombs. And when they dropped it on uh, that terrorist complex in the mountains in North Afghanistan, it flattened everything and collapsed every stronghold that they had under the ground. Listen, the word of God used by the spirit of God will drop a Moab on the works of the devil or seeking to come against you and level every single one. Somebody say hallelujah. What does God want you to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at Ephesians chapter six together. In Ephesians chapter six, we have this famous passage uh, beginning in verse 10 and moving through 18. I'm just gonna read it out loud and then I'm gonna make some text commentary on it. You're probably gonna wanna capture some of this, underline it, circle it, so that you know what weapons you have so when you go out onto the battlefield, when you leave these doors, 
you'll be prepared for what's going to occur. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And again, just so you know, we're not fighting against other human beings, which is our natural inclination to project onto people who are slaves to dark powers who are animating their carnal inclination. Pray for them, don't attack them. Pray for them, don't attack them. Shut down all that invective on your Facebook feed about all the people in politics that you don't like. And instead, why don't you pray for them? Why don't you post something that's encouraging rather than tearing down? There's enough people doing that. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's move on. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, okay, so Paul's just told us that there is a battle array established against us seeking to resist us, seeking to poison our life with ingratitude and invective and hatred and bitterness and sadness. Watch what Paul does next. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore. How many times did he say stand in that last sentence or two? Three times. Church, needs to, church, we need to stand up. We need to stand up to injustice. We need to stand up against the forces of evil that are running rampant in our culture and in our churches and in our families. We need to stand up and be counted as God's men and women. We need to stand up and say no to racism. We need to stand up and say no to poverty. We need to stand up and say no to the people who are intentionally placed on the margins by people who call Jesus their Lord. All right, now I'm about to get prophetic. Get ready, here it comes. I wasn't gonna share this, but God's telling me to, so I'm gonna share it right now. I'll never, ever, 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 ever forget what I'm about to tell you. When I was just a young buck, many moons ago, before this all started coming in white, I was in my first staff role. Big church in New England, congregational, beautiful architecture. It was the place to be from all appearances. And we had a tremendous issue with homelessness and the mentally ill in our community, and they were unwanted. They were shuffled off to the side and arrested, put in group homes and this and that and the other thing. And I had, as a young man, I had my eyes open to this. One day I was in the back of the church greeting people as they walked in in my three-piece suit, because that was the uniform of the day back in those days. And I saw a homeless man from the community come in, and I recognized him, because he used to sit on the bench right in front of my office every day. And he was in a suit. He was in a suit. He must have gone down to Goodwill and purchased a suit with some of the money that he begged and he came in because he wanted to meet with Jesus in the church and look like the church people and sit in our pews and hear what we hear and receive what we receive. And as he came in the door, he looked correct, but he didn't smell quite right, if you know what I mean. And I saw two of the deacons in our church make a beeline right to the back because they recognized them too. And one of them, got on one side, and one of them got on the other, and they hustled him right back out the door. I will never in my life let that happen again. This is a place for, fe for people to meet with Jesus, friends. Put aside your racism and your bigotry and your classism and your genderism and whatever else is your struggle today. Whoever it is that you're looking down your nose at, whether you're aware of it or not, God loves them and he wants them to be here with us. Let's give them some glory for that. Amen. 
There is an accuser, there is a divider, there is one who sows pride, who's the father of pride, and his name is the devil, and we can't be about his business, we've gotta be about the father's business. Let's continue on here. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for the saints. Okay, you ready to capture some of this? Here we go. Notice the command, be strong. Be strong, that's how it begins. It reminds me of Joshua in Joshua chapter one where Moses has died, the one who's known God, who's known God for so many years and who was the spiritual father to the Israelites. And God says, listen, just as I was with Moses, Josh, come over here, boy. Just as I was with Moses, I'm gonna be with you. Be strong, be courageous. Be strong, be courageous. He says it three times and each time I'm picturing Joshua in my mind, going from being overwhelmed, looking at the Jordan River and the fortified cities beyond. I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but uh, in that day, it was quite something to behold. And every time the Lord said, be strong, him standing up a little straighter and straighter, some steel coming into his spine, some strength coming into his legs and his arms, some victory getting ready to be deposited in his soul. I wanna tell you today, as your pastor today, Be strong in the Lord and take courage because where he has guided you, he will provide for you. Somebody say amen. The rest of the story is this. God just didn't wipe the the enemies away. They had to be contested against. Did you catch that? War had to be fought. But before the war could be fought, Joshua and the people of Israel had to put their feet in the raging waters of the Jordan River. They had to exercise faith that God would do what God said he would. So you can't just sit at home and pray and ask God to part the water for you. You have literally got to put your foot in and get your little pinky toe wet. Are we good with that so far? And then you gotta get your ankle wet. And it's gotta go up to the knee and then watch what God does for you. He will make a way where there doesn't appear to be a way. But you need to know what your weapons are. Did you see these? Let's look at them again. What are your weapons here today? You can't go out into combat if you don't have your weapons. Your weapons aren't in working order and you have ammunition for them to employ to achieve the objective. The only way you're gonna achieve the objective God has for your life is for you to rely on these things that he's given you. Let's understand what they are together. The belt of truth. Christians must walk in the truth. We've gotta be people of the truth. That means Jesus' name is the truth, for sure, but we've got to be forthright. We've gotta let our yes be yes and our no be no. Somebody say amen. There's enough deceivers and deceitfulness around and they get their empowerment from the other guy. We need to draw on the one who is the way and the truth and the life. The breastplate of righteousness. The very righteousness of Jesus has clothed you. Walk in it. You don't have to go back to those places where you have had those besetting sins. God's spirit wants to empower you. Some of you are working a program. May I suggest that all of us as Christians need to be working a program and that's understanding more of who God is and allowing more of Jesus to be manifest in our lives and allowing more of the fruit of the spirit from Galatians chapter five to erupt from within us and we won't have anything to worry about. The breastplate of righteousness. Walk in the way of Jesus. Love justice. Act with mercy. Shoes for your feet were the gospel of peace. Listen, if you're trying to argue people into the kingdom of God um, with a turn or burn sermon that you're dropping on them, that usually doesn't work too well, okay? We need to share the good news that peace is at hand and that God desires to welcome us home. That's the message of peace, and we need to live at peace. 
That's why every time that we come for communion, the Bible reminds us that if you're not at peace with your brother, don't take the elements, not because you shouldn't take the elements. God wants you to take the elements so that you be both spiritually and physically encouraged. He wants you to be right with your brother more. He wants you to love your wife the way that she's supposed to be loved. Fellas, when was the last time you told your wife her hair looked nice? I was with a couple recently and my sense was is that the husband wasn't very affirming of his wife. It was written all over her. So I did a little test balloon. You know what I did? Your hair looks nice. It was like I poured 14 gallons of water on a person who was thirsting to death. That's all I said. My wife doesn't mind if I say that, by the way. I think I need to establish that for the record. She knows she's got me firmly in tow. I've got invisible shackles and chains that none of you can see. <clears throat> she just smiles at me with those brown eyes, and I just say, yes, ma'am. I don't care what it is. Whatever you want, dear. She hooked me 25 years ago. Take up the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation and become familiar with the sword of the Spirit. These weapons are for both defense and offense. Frequently when I hear people preach on this, they talk about how only one weapon is for offensive measure and the rest of it is for a defensive posture. Now I think that's technically correct, exegetically speaking, but the inference that we're making there is completely wrong-headed. It's almost as if we need to cower with more defensive weapons because the adversary needs to be resisted. You see what I just did there? We have to go on the offensive. We have to take up the word of God, and as it changes us, go on the offense. In the Marine Corps, we had a, a little axiom, a little short and pithy saying, saying, the best defense is a great offense. So rather than waiting to be attacked, why don't you get up and do some attacking, amen? Now having said that, some of you are new in your journey and you need to be careful that you go, as you go through this boot camp experience that's called life, you have someone in your corner mentoring you and being a spiritual brother or father or sister or mother to you so that you will be equipped for the day of adversity. If you don't have one, may, listen, listen to what, maybe this is the only thing you remember from today's sermon, ask the Father to give you one. He delights to answer those prayers. You can't do it by yourself or you will be taken out. Be alert and be vigilant, Vigilant, it says. So there's this great uh, Old Testament saying that I love to trot out periodically because it just makes me happy to say it. So here we go, you ready? Gird up your loins and act like a man. <laughs> and I'll never forget that because I had an Episcopal friend of mine one day when he was preaching on it, hike his shorts up like this and his wife was absolutely mortified. Wally, I'll never forget that. Thank you, sir. Be alert and be vigilant. Keep your eyes open and saturate everything with prayer. You notice that? Prayer is mentioned again and again and again. Prayer shouldn't be the obligatory thing that we do on the front end and the back end and maybe somebody prays for the preacher. Prayer should be the first thing that we do. Prayer is powerful. Prayer changes things. And not only should we be praying for ourselves, you gotta start with yourself. Has anybody here flown? Raise your hand. It's okay to raise your hand in church. And they go through that whole uh, safety brief that we all kind of disregard and continue to work on our laptops, you know. Maybe we shouldn't do that in case that plane has jet engine trouble or something. One of the things is, if, an exper if the cabin depressurizes, this will pop out of the ceiling, and they always say the same thing next. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Parents, put your own on first before you try to take care of your children. Why? Because you can't help anyone if you're on death's doorstep yourself. You need to pray for yourself. You need to pray for strengthening for yourself. You need to pray for some equipping for yourself so that you've got something to offer. Some of us don't share the gospel. Some of us don't seek to be that mentor because we know that we've got very little to offer. Now, 
For those of you who are feeling ashamed and condemned after that statement, listen to what I'm about to say next. First off, that's the evil one whispering, reject it. There's an opportunity for us to grow and to flourish and become the people that Jesus wants us to be so that we'll have something to give to other people. You can't give anything to anybody else that you don't have for yourself. So what does our arsenal include? Let's take a look here. Let's skip ahead to that slide. I'm gonna talk to my assistant back here. The first thing is this. What do you have in your arsenal today? How can you fight now that you know what your weapons are? First and foremost, capture this. The love letter of Jesus, the Bible. The Bible provides the ammo, the ammunition of prophetic promises to deal death blows to deception. How's that for alliteration? I come from a Baptist background. Prophetic promise to deal a death blow to deception. If you don't know what the truth is, you'll never blunder into it. What does God have to say? I have never met someone who is mature and joyful in the exercise of mission that does not spend time in this. This is where we get our strength. This is where we get our power. This is where we get our insight. And we don't approach it because we have to, we approach it because we get to. Somebody say amen. It's like when you leave the house and your wife's tucked a little, Marie and I have this little thing. We got any children in here in the house? Everybody back there, okay. Marie's wondering where I'm gonna go with this right now. We call it sexy note. So sometimes I'll slip one under her pillow to remind, for her to open when she lays down at night. Fellas, take some notes here. Some of you need to do this, okay? So when I'm away, no, I, I just called your sin out. Don't you try to shush the prophet. So when I'm away, she'll pull this note out or this card or whatever. Fellas, it doesn't have to be anything. I mean, some of you like, uh, I'm not very good with words, Pastor Foy. <laughs> can you say this? I love you and I miss you. See you soon. You can do that. And she'll put sometimes one in my luggage or leave it for me during the day when I'm going about my, going about my tasks. That's the Bible's like that. It's, how, it's like Jesus is saying, hey, I love you and I miss you. Come on, let's sit down at the table and have some food together. Let's dive into Father's Feast here together. Secondly, the second thing that's in our arsenal is persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. Prayer is the means by which things change in earth and on he in heaven and on earth as God moves. Somebody needs to write that down today. Also, it's the means by which we access the treasury of heaven. Some of you are struggling today, not knowing how you're going to do the things that God's called you to do. May I ask you a very simple and perhaps redundant question? Have you asked him to meet that need? Jesus said in the Gospels, you have not because you ask not. If God's got a dream for your life that he's put there, he's going to enable you to carry it out. All you have to do is ask dad for some money, like my daughter does when she comes home. Dad, can I have some money? Yeah, of course you can. Go out and have fun. I think God wants to open up his wallet and give us the things that we need to do his work because he wants us to enjoy our lives proclaiming the message of Jesus, amen? If you're walking around like, like this, <laughs> Jesus loves you, man. Like you sucked a lemon or you're spiritually constipated. I, <laughs> listen, I wouldn't want to listen to anything you have to say. Why don't we work on sitting at the master's feet, resting our head on the father's chest, getting in line with his heartbeat for people and for us and receiving some joy and walk in it. Somebody say amen. We've gotta pray. We've gotta approach him. He loves to hear his children pray. He loves to answer those prayers and he will blow you away when you ask with expectancy for him to complete the work that he's done in you. The third thing is extravagant worship. Worship, who here likes to worship? Put both one hand up, okay. For those of you who are Presbyterians, put both hands up now. <laughs> they all drop, look at that. Lord Jesus, have mercy on them right now. Extravagant worship. Listen, when I was preaching in Haiti on this, about worship, these guys ate it up. When they, when they worshiped, it was loud and it was long and it was gymnastic, my friends. 
Listen, when you worship God, there's power from heaven that's unleashed. The scripture says that God is enthroned. He has given a throne on the praises of his people. Does anybody believe that today? Instead of carping and complaining, why don't you get your Jesus jam on? Why don't you glorify God in the sanctuary? Why don't you lift up his name in the midst of adversity? Brother Mike just lays his hand over there. That's what I'm talking about. When you worship the evil one has to flee because when the name of Jesus is pronounced, evil's got to scatter. Worship. Worship. How about your authority? Now, this might be a new concept for some of us here. We have authority because we're connected to Jesus. We have authority because Father, his father is now our father, and we can walk in that, and we can exercise that authority biblically because Jesus has accomplished the central defining task of humanity, and he has given us his power. So when I see evil at work in somebody's life, I speak promises of God over them, and I command evil to flee. Not in my strength, not in my power, but because of what the Bible has to say. If God's people would realize who they are and act in it, we'd see some changes around here. Let me encourage you to do some study in the scripture and to realize what the scope of your authority looks like. It doesn't take away anything from Jesus as if we could. In the name of Jesus, be empowered to exercise your authority. I love some of these texts, I'm just gonna speak them over you. How about this, my peace I leave with you. He's given you his peace, share that peace, proclaim that peace over other people's lives as well. How about this, you will do greater things yet when he spoke to his disciples. That means we are called to continue on in the ministry of reconciliation in all kinds of spectacular and supernatural matters. And then, I love this one, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, he says, I have given you the keys to the kingdom. And that wasn't just to Peter, that was to all of the disciples. You have authority. It wasn't for establishing a pope, it was to empower the people of God. When we bless people in the name of Jesus, they're blessed. When we curse the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus, they are broken. Let's start taking our authority for real. Expectant faith, this is the last one, or not the last one, the second to the last one here. Expect great things from God and attempt them. When was the last time you asked God for a BHAG? Does anybody know what a BHAG is? I had a, a mentor who used to say that. A big, hairy, audacious goal, like a gorilla. By the way, Maria says when I preach, sometimes I do a gorilla dance. I don't believe it. Does anybody believe that here this morning? Yeah. Did you say yes down there? Who was that? I want to talk to you after the service. When was the last time that we asked God for something miraculous that would prove that he was listening and that he was loving and that he was acting and there was going to be freedom delivered? Adoniram Judson, who was a great missionary uh, to the Far East, said something uh, that, I, that I quote to myself often. He said, expect great things from God and attempt great things from God. Does anybody here in the avenue believe that today? There was a missionary to China many years ago who labored his whole life to build churches, to reach people, to transform the Chinese culture with the gospel. And at the end of his missionary uh, season, right before he died, he had very little to show for it. And people asked him if he was discouraged to have so little to show. And he responded to them in, this, in these words, what I have sown into the Chinese people, will, the Father will reap in due season. You know how many Chinese Christians there are now? Between three and 400 million. 
more than the people who live in the United States because of one man's faithfulness to attempt great things for God and expect a harvest, if not in his lifetime, then in the, the years that would follow. Does that stir courage up in you today? It does me. Take the step, sacrifice, step forward in the midst of your journey. Well, how do our weapons destroy strongholds? The first one, you ready? The gospel will break the stranglehold of sin. Can we move to that next? It breaks the stranglehold of sin in the life of the unbeliever. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? Romans 10, 17. It brings the dead to life. That's what the gospel does. But it also helps those of us who are walking with Jesus to come to deeper life encounter with him also. The power of the gospel breaks the shackles of demonic oppression. That's the second one from Acts chapter 16. Somebody needs to write this down. There are such things at work out in the world around us, and they try to hide, but when they are cornered, they will snarl and reveal themselves like junkyard dogs. And if you don't believe me, I will tell you stories after this service that my own eyes have seen. I'm gonna share this one with you because I think you need to hear this. In the middle of preaching through the Gospel of Mark, in one of our church planting experiences. We had a family that we connected with, very troubled family, we knew they were troubled, and the oldest daughter, I suspected, was abusing drugs. But she wanted to hang with us, so we welcomed her to our table, welcomed her to our home, welcomed her into her, our church, and in the middle of preaching on a passage like this, and let's look at it together, I'm gonna read this one from Acts, this is the Apostles, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, that means she foretold the future, and brought her owners much profit by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these servants are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Did you just hear what happened there? When the people of God enter into places of darkness, even the darkness must acknowledge the truth. Look what happens next. She kept doing this for many days and Paul having become greatly annoyed. <laughs> he's trying to preach and the demons were giving testimony to the validity of his sermon while he was trying to execute it. In the middle of his sermon, he turned to the spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out that very hour. This stuff happens. Back to my story. I was preaching through uh, Jesus' encounter with a demo the demoniac at Gadarene, the one who nobody could chain up and who lived amongst the tombstones. And as I was preaching, and when I preach, I get in a zone, so I don't know what's out happening out there. You could be all on your cell phones right now, and I probably wouldn't even see you. I was in the zone preaching this uh, sermon, and this young woman began to have a manifestation in her body eyes rolling back, convulsions, the whole deal. And thank God my wife was right there and a charismatic lady who was attending our church and they hustled this young woman back and prayed over her for the remainder of the service. This happens. I had people who didn't come back to church after that Sunday. Some of you are thinking right now, yeah, that would have been me. I called my boss, my district superintendent, and I said, you're never gonna believe what happened in church yesterday. He said, tell me. So I told him, he goes, good, I hope it happens again. I said, are you kidding me, boss? He said, and I'll never forget, he said, listen, son, they hide. So when they, are, when they manifest, that means the kingdom of God is breaking in in significant ways, and our duty in that point is to exercise pastoral care by praying for them, exercising our authority, and seeing that person given freedom. The good stuff's real, and the bad stuff's real too, friends. We ignore it at our peril. Be prepared to encounter those who are under the, bound, the, the binding of oppression. The power of the gospel to silence both heresy and unholy living. 
The gospel is the truth, and when people twist the, twist the truth, you need to know how to bring light to bear there. And to do that, you need to know what the Bible says. It also is a corrective in the midst of unholy living. Uh, somebody asked me what personal holiness looked like recently, and I told them, it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a, do you drink, do you smoke, do you go bowling, or hang out with girls who do. That's not what it's about. And this person was coming from that kind of a background. I came from that kind of a background. I said, listen, friends, and I think some of us need to be set free of this misperception this morning too. To pursue personal holiness is to take on more of the character of Jesus, to come to him for he's gentle, gentle and lowly and bringing rest to the soul. It's to allow more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit kindness, gentleness, patience to erupt from within us. That is the pursuit of personal holiness that Father is interested in. Does that resonate with anybody here today? Well, how does this whole thing end? The battle's been won at Calvary. The band's coming up behind, so this is the point of the service where I tie it all together, you ready? The battle's been won at Calvary, and we know that the struggle will end and the gospel will triumph over every foe. We should expect to see that. We should expect to see the kingdom breaking in. We should expect to see people turning to Jesus. We should expect to see, see people delivered from addiction. We should, see, we should expect to see people set free from evil habits and affliction. Remember that passage where Jesus said, Pray that the Lord would send workers into the harvest because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Here in the United States, we get that flipped around. It's almost like we've got spiritual dyslexia and that's no offense to anyone who struggles with dyslexia here. Maria always makes me say that, so. We hear those verses and we think that the harvest is feeble and there's too many people out doing it. Did you catch what I just said? The harvest is plentiful, Master says. And he's looking for people who are, who've been set free from their chains, who have been filled by his spirit, who have been grounded in his word, who are living in community together to say, here I am, Lord, send me. That is my prayer for you today. As we have explored the nature of spiritual warfare, as we have systematically examined, if only in overview, the weapons the Father has given you, that you would be set free in the name of Jesus to pursue your destiny, to be filled with every empowerment that the great Father of heaven desires and delights to give you. Would you stand with me now? Matt and the team are gonna take us into another season of worship. So let's worship extravagantly. I wanna invite my prayer team friends to come forward at this time. If you need to get right with Jesus, if you need to be introduced to Jesus, if you need to be healed, if you need to have ministry gifts activated or imparted, if you wanna get serious and be about the Father's business, come up and let us pray with you. Each and every one of you, I'm feeling like I need to say this today, each and every one of you are world changers. Somebody just received that right now. You are world changers. You will touch people that I never can. You will be the hands and feet of Jesus. You will be the mouthpiece of Jesus, even in the midst of your brokenness. Allow him to use you and receive the fullness of what's already been appointed in Jesus' name.